Okay, how many of you saw the announcement that said we can have in-person labs? So let's see some reactions. Yep, I saw it. I think that's great. Anybody? I'm excited. I'm excited yeah, to come I did. Um, I'm wondering the time, actually. Okay, good. And thank you, Spencer. I heard you say that before. And then, mm -hmm. uh, Victoria, did you see that? Yes, I did. I'm actually kind of looking forward to it. Okay, awesome. And Miranda? Yeah, I... I was really excited when I read that. Yeah, very exciting. And Kara, you're you're a bit far away, but it doesn't matter. You can have uh, you can have a, still a solo lab. Like you can sign up for some times, okay? If you want to do that. So let's look at some times that are available, and I will try and note them um, because we are doing fittings, as I said, for Antigone. I'm just trying to look at the calendar. I know we have some. We have. You know, it's always the problem with um, fittings is that some people do not respond. And so we're still trying to get a hold of some people. So um, maybe uh, today I can only do after four o'clock. So that's one option. Let me just maybe make a note. Monday after four. And then Tuesday, I could do between two and four. And you want to be able to come for maybe two hours, I think, or at least one hour so that you can, you can plan some time. And that way, if there's anything that you have a question on as far as any of the sewing projects, because that is due at the, this, that's due this week so that all of the sewing notebooks should be together. So I'm going to say Monday. I can do after four. Tuesday, I can do two to four. And Wednesday, I could do, or I could do, wait a minute, Tuesday. Yeah, otherwise it would have to be after 6 p.m. And on Tuesday. And Wednesday, I can do, I don't think there's anything else on Wednesday. So I could do after the makeup class at 3.15. 3.15 to 5.15. Now, does anybody want to take one of those slots? Smenson, do you have a, a preference? I'm okay. Uh, I just only have your class and one class in the morning, and that's it. Do you want to come today at 4? Yeah, I can do it if, if you can. Okay, and do you have hospital today or no? What, sorry? Do you have to go to the hospital today? No, tomorrow. Okay, so let's, oh, I can do it today. let's do it at 4 o'clock today. Okay. Yeah, cool. And then does anyone else want to do um, tomorrow between two and four? I have to go to the hospital. I can't. You know, you're going to do today. So you don't need to sign up. Okay. okay. Um, we could do Thursday morning. So tell me what times you would like to go. And if you don't want to commit right now, you can take a, uh, just email me and I'll post these, these times for sure. And then we can also make some others, but that way you can actually come to campus. We've had people come to campus before. Miranda's come for a fitting, so she knows that we are very COVID aware and how we handle everything. And in this um, room, we have excellent ventilation. We also have exterior air and um, we can easily, you can easily social distance from anybody else who's in the room. But I planned on one person at a time I do have three students in this class that are living together, so they could come at the same time. So, Pam, I think um, I'll I'll come up Wednesday afternoon. What time did you say it was? Want to come three fifteen? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, perfect. So I know that I had gotten emails from people that said, you know, I I even though I've looked at the video, I really don't understand this particular hand sewing stitch. Perfectly great. Let's do those kinds of things so that you can get your um, sewing notebooks in. Let's look quickly at this week's to do. So Pam, I noticed that um, on the complete personal sewing resource, you um, slipped in there the bias strip. Oh yeah. <laughs> is there a way, are you gonna teach us that or is there? Very good, yes. I have actually demonstrated that a couple of times, but let's do the bias strip right now. You have? Why yeah. wasn't it on our original? It's on the original. Um, it's on this. Let's go to the sewing portfolio. Did we do it? Like we didn't do it. We 
I showed you how to draw it. So buy a strip is here. But if you look at the sewing resource portfolio here, where it gives the points page, and this is no problem at all, um, Cara, don't even worry about that. It's totally fine, that's why we do this. So this might be small. Remember, if you go to screen share, you can actually change the view of how you're looking at something. But the bias strip is here and it's um, the bias sample and it's five points. So this is everything that should be in it. And then plus remember, there are the extra credits in here as well. Oh, is the bias sample just how we tear our material? Uh, it's the 45 degree angle. So let me get oh. that. Yeah, let's oh, okay. get that set up. No, absolutely no worries on that. Let me go to the, the whole thing, the presentation is 50 points. So your individual points you have, and then you have another 50 points for that. Let's go for the presentation. And remember, Cara had this very great idea of actually just filming it and going through her notebook on the phone so that you could uh, see it that way. And that was really kind of a good idea. So you could do that and get your points. So um, let me go back to the overview. We'll do the overview and then we will discuss the complete sewing portfolio. I'll demo the bias and we're, we'll talk about moving forward. So looking back, we can see the play critique is here. Closures, hand sewing, submit the midterm last week, and here's our overview. And then we'll go down um, as we go along. So here's our overview. Remember, if you click on this is where you'll get to the overview. So today, your crew handbook, which is the Antigone study, you should have some kind of color collage for the emotion of the play. And we'll, I will, um, uh, we're gonna, we'll take a break and I'll show you some from what we did last year. I'll just show you a couple of ideas of what people did. Then we need to have your play critique for looking back, looking forward. So try to view that. It is due on Wednesday, but if you look at that assignment, you'll see that you have probably at least another week after that to submit it. So the play critique format is there and the um, due date is there on that assignment. And just if you just wanna jot down your notes, we can go through each of these and we can talk about them on the modules. Your complete sewing portfolio is due. We'll review measurements, which we did on Wednesday. And we're gonna have the pattern lecture. That will be your patterning materials that you have in your supplies bag. And we might begin the COVID mask. I'm gonna to talk to you about how to prepare to get your supplies together for that. So that's gonna be this week, okay? So you wanna hold your ideas, write down your questions. Just take a couple minutes for that. We'll leave that page up for a sec so you can think about it. And then we can absolutely go back and forth and um, decide what we need. So I'm gonna show you the color collage. We'll do, talk about the plate critique, the sewing portfolio, the bias strip, review the measurements we went over on Wednesday, begin the pattern lecture. This is, this is for the whole week, okay? So it may or may not be something that we absolutely do on Zoom. This might be you want to review the measurement lecture or the measurement, the measurement documents that are in the measurement page and see if you understand what they are after the lecture that we did on Wednesday. And if you don't understand, then you want to bring those things up. Okay. All righty, let me stop the share. Pam, I have uh, just a question about the portfolio. Yeah, we're gonna talk about each item, okay? Okay, okay. Yeah, so uh, was that Victoria? No, it was Miranda. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about uh, anybody have, shall we look at the crew handbook, what is the collage first? Has everyone read Antigone? Remember we spent some time discussing Antigone in class breaking down how the family groups work, how they might be, um, uh, how, they, how an audience, a contemporary audience would view this play. 
And then to try and understand the play, it's a good idea to create, get something visual on paper so that you can have a better way of communication. Because when we start just thinking in our mind, we can't necessarily communicate to people who are, um, who, with whom we're trying to work, what we're actually trying to get at. So let me show you a couple of, um, let me see if I can find those, I'm, I can find them, but let me show you some interesting things about collages. And I will just, I'm just going to post them right here. So that you can see them. And these were from some, uh, these were from the one X that we did last semester. So let's just take a quick look at that. And then I've put them into your, I've put them into our overview so you can take a look. So these represent what students felt about their one act play that they were gonna do. And this is a way that you can create an expression. So here's a color collage for the motion of a particular play. This whole box that you're, the whole screen is looking at. And note that there's really no figure in it. They're really just trying to think about what is this play about? And if you look at this, you can see, you, what do you see here? What are some things that you can see in this, this expression? I see lots of color. Lots of color. Absolutely, lots of color. Anything else? What do you think? So there's colorful things. That, that tells you something about the content. What else about the content do you think might be going Maybe on? Maybe something about travel Good. with all the flags, different yeah. countries, A movement. Lot of different countries represented here, absolutely. And anything dominant, Smenson. Do you see any dominant countries? Look at this, you know, Tibet, Sichuan, all of these kinds of countries, these different kinds of flags, Japan, Great Britain, what's going on back here. And there's some sort of theatricality in this part, some sort of music. So you can get a wide variety of emotion. What kind of an emotion do you think is behind this? Bright colors, travel, movement, Okay, let's go to the most basic. Happy or sad? Happy. Looks happy. Looks happy. Looks happy, except for this strange little guillotine thing in the corner, right? <laughs> yeah. We're gonna maybe we're gonna chop some heads off. So there's some sort of it feels happy. There's a lot of movement, and then there's some kind of strange surprise that might happen. So there's something on edge going on. And that's, you know, it's certainly with Antigone, we would have a lot of things like that, but it's just something to keep in mind. How can you express and talk to somebody else about what you're thinking? Here's another one that is more abstract. What do you think about this one? I say like mad scientist or a thinker. <laughs> I should go look at what this one is. The other one was a, the other one was sort of a time travel thing. And it ended up that there was a, that the lead character was actually dead or something. So it was this kind of strange time travel and you, you couldn't tell if he was actually dead because it was his dream or did it really happen? And then the end, it was his dream. So that was this, that was this piece. And that's why there's this kind of guillotine thing here. And, and, but this whole, time travel and a bunch of different countries and but it was a theatrical he, oh I think he was actually a TV star so that was that so it's I'm, I actually didn't remember it until we looked at this collage so what is what do you think about this collage just look at it for a few minutes everyone's going to talk I'd like everyone to talk just think about it what is like what's up uh, what is the major 
thing you notice about it? Just hold it, hold that thought for a sec. What do you notice about this collage? And then we'll- I noticed the circular movement. So um, saying like, a circular, circular, circular. Certainly there is a lot of circular. That's a really good uh, observation. Victoria, what do you see? Um, I see the eyes in the corner. Yeah, right here. Like above the earth. And then I see the earth as well. So the eyes possibly looking down on earth or looking at yeah. on earth, right? Something like that. Okay, that's a really good observation because they're, they're put in there slightly obscurely, don't you think? You know? Yeah, definitely. If you don't really look carefully, you may miss them. So that's kind of a good, very, very interesting observation. Smenson, what do you see? Smenson, what do you see? Okay, Miranda. I noticed that there's like, I don't know if this means anything, but there's like black and white more, and then like the swirl um, on the top left is like black and browns, like, and then on the, like that's more to the left and then on the right is more color, mm -hmm. um, which I don't know if that says anything about the show, but that's just an observation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I think that's an also an excellent observation. And then Cara. Just like I had said, just to me, it kind of just feels like mad scientist. Like, yeah, right. Sorry. I forgot the mad scientist. That's right. okay. <laughs> like the reality is some sort of thinker, but then there's some sort of like fantasy or which is the color illusion part. Right. So I think that's all that all really ties in together because this portion where we have this clearly mathematical formula stuff and looking in this vast sort of observatory room, like there could be a lecture being given here. And these are people that are sitting in the gallery or something like that. And then as this moves, as Miranda wisely said, from black and white swirling around into color and that repeats Catherine's swirl idea so that even though every individual thing is swirling the entirety of it is swirling and then being observed by these eyes that Victoria has um, noted and so I think that's very very interesting let me just go I actually want to try and yeah okay just want to make sure I saved so that gives you an idea. I'm just gonna look and see who's, what that particular, um, I wanna look at what that particular story was. Uh, what did they do? I can remember the, I can remember the, um, okay, the two people that did it and I can remember the play. Let me just think about that for a minute. Um, and I remember, oh, I know what that was. That was very interesting because it was a, um, it was a play about the life of a fly. And there was a David Attenborough character so they have their, uh, who was narrating this whole thing about this fly, these, this male and female fly couple, they meet, you know, and they live only one day. So they talk about each of these things. So they start out in this kind of murkiness, which would be the black and white. And he's very mathematical and talks about it, the David Attenborough character. And then as they move through great feelings of emotion and color and life, and then they go back to death. So it's, it was, and then observed by the David Attenborough character, he's actually we see as we are in this play longer that it, he is narrating it for his TV show. So 
that that's more the meaning of that particular collage. So just cut, and it doesn't have to be that detailed, but just think about this idea of what does Antigone mean so that we have that feeling. Um, and so that's the collage portion. Does anyone have a question about the play critique for looking back, looking forward? You need to take, it's about maybe 90, not quite 90 minutes. You need to take some time and see that with your free ticket as Miranda was in that, and then uh, write your observations based on the play critique, which is in the modules and talk about it. Now we talked about that a week ago because Cara came in, she was so excited that she'd seen it and it was really fun. Okay, any questions, no questions on that then, correct? Except how do I find time to do that, right? I totally, I totally hear you on that. Um, okay, let's go to the sewing portfolio then. And Miranda, um, do you have a question before we talk about uh, the bias? Uh, yes, I just have a little question and you might have gone over this. I just wanted to double check um, that for the portfolio, would you like how you want it um, like presented? Um, okay. Like, do you want it in a physical notebook or, or on a Google slide or or what, what do you prefer? Okay, so, you know, here's my philosophy about teaching. This is a class for you guys and for you to demonstrate how you want to learn and the best way for you to learn. So if it's easiest for you to put it in a Google slide so that you can just scan down the whole slide portion, that's completely fine. If it's easiest for you to put it in a notebook and page through it old school and hold it up, you know, or put your put your notebook down. Uh, like when I'm filming certain things, I do. Um, I just put the camera. So I'll show you, you know, like if I'm filming, you know, I can put the camera here or you can do this if you're working on either a phone or a laptop. You can put it this way and make sure that you can see it and then just uh, turn your pages. Okay. If you want to do that and then lift up, I can get the notebook and show you. Let me just get one for you to see. I think I demoed this maybe, but I don't know if I did. Do any of you know how to do a collage online? Excellent question. Excellent question. So hold on to that thought for a second, Cara. So this, you know, is a way that you could do it and show me here's my bias strip. You can show me that this is my straight edge. Here's my stretch. Right? Okay. Yeah. And then, but it's okay to take a photograph of it. Show me both the inside and the right right side, the right side would be your um, darker fabric piece. You can take a photograph of this and put it in a Google slide. Totally okay. fine, okay? Okay. But because when you submitted, I should be able to read this portion. But right. what's important is, can you access the material? Uh -huh. that's, that's what the, um, the points are based on accessing the material. Okay. okay, any questions on the presentation portion? Basically, any way you wanna present it, as long as I can see the information is totally good. Um, let's talk, go back to what Cara said about doing a collage online. So Cara, you can grab internet images and you can put them in a Word document and you can overlay them. You can do, um, you can old school it and cut things out of magazines, my favorite way. And I'll show you some like that, that you can then just take a picture of. Um, that's totally okay as well. And anybody else, who would, who, how would you do it? Who has had to do a presentation online? I know that there, anybody who's had to do, um, you know, like any kind of web work you can, you can do online. What would you do, Miranda? Would you do it online or old school it with um, magazines? Or you I would definitely old school it. I love collaging and taking things out of magazines. So definitely old school. Right. So 
that's completely fine. And if you don't have magazines, Carl, one thing you can do is then get some images on the internet and kind of group them together, make one print, and then use those to, you know, deconstruct them and then put them on a piece of paper. And what I usually did was give, give you a piece of paper, but you can do it on an eight and a half by 11 or slightly bigger, and then you can just take a photograph of it. How, how yeah, I've done it old school, but I've always, I've needed to do it digitally and I've never quite figured it out besides a Word document, but okay. I only put the pictures next to each other. I don't know how to layer them. I didn't know you could, so. Right. I was just curious if there was a program or something. Or that do you see. have, um, do you have Keynote? Do you have a Mac? I do have a Mac. I don't think I've ever used it. <laughs> this well, in Keynote, Hold on, you yeah. can. Oh, hold on a second. So for this part, because we are recording and it's a wonderful opportunity, I'm trying to I'm trying to get the view again. Let me just do this. So you guys show your faces so that Catherine, you're talking, and I'd like to pin you so you can talk about. Oh, how all right. It works. Okay. I look a little disheveled here this morning, but I will I will show my face. We're all good um, with that. So do you what what I was going to okay. Do you have uh can you do a brief little demo of Keynote? I haven't used it in a while. That's um okay. not but bad. it's not this is just I, share information time. Yeah. But it is really easy to use. It is part of the Mac suite and that you can you essentially create slides and it's really easy to drag and drop photos in there and layer them and resize them. It's, it's, it's pretty fun actually. Um, so if you have it, it might be worth playing around with. Yeah, I've got it. Cool. Thank you. I will definitely try it. I've never, I've had Apple products forever and I've never used it. So yeah, it's, it's a really, really useful program for Mara, presentations. Would you, um, so maybe you want to think about that for a second, Catherine, and then maybe Kara and Catherine, you guys could be do a breakout room and just kind of trade information back and forth, maybe on Wednesday. Yeah, I'd be happy to. That'd be cool. Yeah. Okay. And so then also then Miranda, you might want to show some of your old school stuff on Wednesday. We can do different kinds of breakout rooms that would show different expression. And we can then talk about have some materials together so you can begin to talk about Antigone that way. And then you can, through your process, work on layering those things. Okay? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, great. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Victoria, is that, uh, are you up for that? Let's use. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> I saw your mic go off. Um, I think that it would be great to be able to use the time in class so that we can do some of those things. So I'm gonna, uh, let's, let's, I have uh, 1027, I'm gonna take a short, very short break so that I can set the board up, do the demo for bias and also show a couple of other um, of um, collage things and then we'll continue on. So let's just do, let's do 1045. We're going to go right into the bias and then we will discuss um, the collage and Antigone. I want to I want to show you a progression of collage just because Carr brought that up and I think that's very handy and show you a wide a, a way that you can deal with that as well. So if you remember what I did with my sample. The first day when we discussed our sewing bags right? The very number one thing says one square fabric with a selvage. So we have the lengthwise and the crosswise grain with the bias indicated. Okay. So the bias is at, remember a woven fabric is two pieces interlocking at 90 degrees. Next week when we start our fabric identification, you'll learn that. And the bias is that portion, which is at 45 degrees to the 90. Remember the lengthwise grain has no stretch. 
crosswise grain has a little bit of ease. You can see that movement slightly and the bias has a significant amount of stretch. So Kara brought up this very brilliant idea of bias tape. And when you finish something with bias tape, you are finishing the edge instead of doing what we've done, which is a, um, we've done an overlock, we've done a zigzag, we've done a straight stitch, we've done a fold. So bias tape, you can buy like this. Generally it's found in packages like this. So you buy a three yard piece. We buy hundreds of yards at a time of certain colors and it is pre-folded so that when you unfold it, you have two, two spaces and then it can fold together and you could stitch this onto an edge and it could be a great finished piece. Okay, see how that works? Because it has movement, it can go around corners because it has stretch. I've had bias made when I worked on uh, the movie Stuart Little and did all of the sails, I had to have bias cut pieces so that we could trim the sails in matching. Now, weirdly, this looks like it is straight, but the pattern is printed on the bias. Watch this. So this is an entire bias ribbon, very uh, thick. But if I wanted to create a bias tape of this, I would fold it in to make my center and then fold like this around the edge so that I would have a stretchy trim that could finish off any seam. So there are companies that specialize in cutting bias for you if you need a very narrow piece of trim. And particularly for manufacturers who may be using it as a detail, then they're getting hundreds of yards. So I could even get it done for 30 yards at a time. And it was, it was not co really cost prohibitive. So again, if we're looking at our bias strip, we're looking at the um, straight of grain and the straight of grain here. So on the board, I have the lengthwise grain. And remember that's indicated by the arrow. I have a crosswise grain. This is also known as the warp. Remember, warp speed. And the crosswise grain is known as the weft. If you fold the crosswise grain to the lengthwise grain, you get the bias because this is 90 degrees and this is 45 degrees. So all of you who thought that your geometry was never gonna amount to anything, so here it is. So I have my lengthwise grain indicated on my fabric piece. I've cut my bias and I have my crosswise grain. So this would, you can see how this would meet in this way. Right, there's my corner. And that's my lengthwise grain. And this is then cut on the bias so it stretches. So if I have a piece of fabric, just a random piece, I'm gonna show you how to do this. Remember, I'm gonna use my non-stretch to indicate that's my lengthwise grain. Slightly stretch is my crosswise. If I fold my crosswise grain to my lengthwise grain, creating a triangle like this, I will get the bias and you'll see that this is very stretchy. So let me do that for you on the ironing board. So I've determined my lengthwise grain and I have my salvage marked. But if I was working on this side and I didn't have my salvage marked, I would be able to find that. So let me just tear a corner and find that. I'm going to do a small cut. 
and tear. So I am getting a nice even piece and I can unravel that piece. Again, I'm going to iron along the grain line. So I can move, remove one thread all the way along so I know I have an even thread. Can I remove one thread all the way along this side? Right until I get to that corner. So let me just cut this at the corner. Again, when we do this, we wanna make sure our fingers are very close to the cut so that we can tear it evenly and then iron so that we get rid of any place that may be distressed. Okay, so I have two very even uh, straight of grains. And if I don't have a salvage, I know my test is to pull this one, no movement, the cross grain has some movement, and then as I demoed on the board, if I fold the cross grain to the lengthwise grain, that because this is a 90 degree, to bisect that in half gives me my 45. So that's my 45, there's my stretch. You can see it stretches significantly. So let's do that again and then we'll mark it. And this is a really handy thing because you know you can make all those beautiful 30 stresses were made from the bias. Again, I'm not ironing along there as much as I'm ironing my straight of grain because I can stretch that out of shape easily. I ironed it just so that I have a line against which I can cut. Okay, so there now I have a crease right here. I'm gonna go ahead and mark my straight of grain by putting my ruler on the straight so I can see this is my straight of grain right here and that's usually indicated by lengthwise. So you, I don't know, you can see my arrow there. And now I'm going to make a line along my fold and another line on the other side of my ruler and you could do a, whatever size you want, okay? So that I, I actually do have some of my lengthwise grain indicated. I can continue it. And then I simply cut. And I know that I'm cutting along my bias because that's this is on my fold line. And you get that fold line by folding your cross grain to your lengthwise grain. And I could do, there's a whole way of learning about how to make continuous bias strips and everything. So if I needed to use this to do something stretchy, look at the movement that I have. If I wanted to create my self bias, remember I'm using my two inch ruler so I could just fold this in. And one thing that you should note about joining bias together is you have to sew your straight of grains together because otherwise you're gonna be sewing two wiggly edges. So if I did this, I would get a bias tape and I would have myself bias. But your only requirement is to cut a bias, indicate your straight of grain, which is here, and then you know, what are the properties of the bias? Why do we use it? What's important about it? And I'll show this on my, my smaller piece, which I have, which I demoed on the board, but was maybe not dark enough to see. I'll just use my pencil and make it a little darker here. So this is my straight of grain. I want to I want to mount it that way so that and here's my cross grain. Remember I put it in the corner and that indicates my bias. 
you just put that on your page. Okay, questions on the bias? None? Now you can see that's very clear. And we can put this piece that I marked back up here. And you can see that. And the piece that I just cut. Here's my straight of grain. It's just a bigger piece. And see how it fits into our bias. So it's really just a cutting exercise from one of your samples. So any questions on any part of the sewing notebook? None? No, I'm good now. Perfect, okay. And uh, then let's go on and I'm gonna show you some quick collage ideas. Looking for my eraser. To start with a non-figurative collage, emotional, you can just use something that is really uh, as rich as this. Now this is old school. This is with um, colored paper. So you can see that that get, has a lot of interesting emotion and detail and maybe something erupting right here. And thinking about the play, what gives you an emotional response? This is a monochromatic color scheme. So uh, this would be, you know, this is a highly charged piece with a lot of red, maybe indicating a lot of blood, indicating a lot of highly charged emotion. Different piece, again, non-figurative, working from color. Again, it has sort of a, maybe a swirl effect, but you can see, I'm trying to get a little bit of a white border so you see the edges of it. This is a second, here we go. There you go. So you can see that it, it can start in one, and move on the outside dark edges into brighter color in the center. So maybe the center of the play has an emotional content that it brings joy and happiness, but a lurking around the edges is something that might be darker. Maybe this represents the resolution in the center. So it gives you some inspirational feeling. Once you get something like this, you can discuss with the director. Sometimes they're not interested in discussing it. I will tell you that. And maybe you want to have something that's a little more figurative. This was really an interesting um, accident. I was doing a play and I happened to see, this is all, well, I guess it's not, I was going to say this is all one piece, but I put it into this giant hand. And this is um, the Mad Woman of Shio, where everybody goes down into the sewer. <laughs> The sewer man is actually one of the more important characters. It's French, so we have a wide, a sort of an emblematic French flag, but everything is swirling around and gonna end up and showing the importance of the sewer man. You see somebody kind of trying to get out of there, a bunch of celebrity images. And so that has a little bit of figurative and a way to maybe express a play. But if you start with the emotional content and you work to something like this, then, you're, then your um, director is kind of wowed by you. And you can go to something that is more figurative and gives us more of a, of a feeling of this is what they're going to look like. And this would be, you know, in the 40s so that you can see the 40s feel. This is the 30s, late 30s. Then we go, are starting here. This is in the teens. So there's some kind of traveling. This was from Lifeboat where we traveled back and forth between multiple years from, this is the Lifeboat was based on the Titanic. 
So we started in very early 1900 and to see what men and women were looking like here in the 1900s, 1900s formal dress every day, every day wear, this was sportswear and what people might be looking at, a painting, uh, different kinds of paintings and catalog imagery. There was a ball, so that's why the formal wear is represented. And we went from the 1900, early 1900, clear up until, I can't remember, I think 1938 or something like that. So that's when we get these later images. And another way that you can do it, then I said, you know, you would represent a character. This is sort of representing a generic entire show, how characters may look. And this is representing simply one character. So actually not just one character, but this is the show High Society, as you can see. There were, I think there were like four panels of this. So there were different um, moments that were represented by the play so that this is a costume way of storyboarding the play for the director. So this is Liz at the party Uncle Willie at the party, Mike at the party, Tracy at the party, and you can see she's front and center. The uh, maids played a huge role. The help played a huge role in this so that they told the backstory of the party. Tracy party uh, in this red tone. Dexter, forget Tracy, I'm going to Africa. So he's dressed up to go on safari. The little sister as a bridesmaid the mother in the party, the whole, and she was in silver, the whole general party feel. What does, a, what does the group look like and feel together? How can we get this sort of feeling of party? Um, Uncle Willie's serving staff, Uncle Willie's serving staff. So the men would be in white with black, the women would be in black with white details. And you can see here's the details here showing those and then parties in their, they're really wearing, some are wearing tailcoats, some are wearing tuxedos, so that we can see George is at the party. And this gives a one really specific feeling for the party, one moment in the play, how everyone can be represented. So, you know, Liz is a reporter, so she's not going to be nearly as sophisticated as the mother of the bride in the uh, fancier dress or the sister who's a younger and a juvenile. The, the spurned husband, um, Dexter, is not at the party. He's going to be going on safari. Okay, so you can see that it's a way to storyboard an entire image of the play so that the director has a feel for exactly what is going to happen. Now, it's true that you could do costume renderings for this, but I have found that this is a much more representational way of doing it, that directors often don't understand costume renderings. And the time to do a costume rendering is fairly intense. So I have to plug in. When I worked with a um, sketch artist, then at the Costume Designers Guild, there are, there are three categories of um, members, costume designers, assistant costume designers, and sketch arts, uh, costume illustrators. She said that it took her eight hours to do a costume illustration. So that from beginning to end, one costume illustration, eight hours. So when you're talking about a play that could have 80 or 100 costume changes, and you're not working a year or more in advance so that you can actually think about what those people are going to look like, research it, talk to the director, see what kind of ideas that they have. Um, then you need sort of a shortcut way to discuss things and using pre-existing ideas is a way to discuss it and then put on color information. So when we have the costume design class next spring, that's one of the things that we will talk about. So any questions on the collage and on Wednesday, we'll have some time to work on Keynote and I'll take a look at that as well. Okay, so that we have that.
So yeah, I'll have my, um, Pam, I'll have my uh, desktop computer back up because it, when my power went off, everything kind of shut down. So I'll, I'll have that prepped so I can show everybody. Absolutely. That would be so terrific because I think it's a good um, thing to understand a simple way uh, to do things like SketchUp is a simple way to also look at what is, how can you do information and put information down on a, um, in a very quick way in a sketch if you don't have anything that is like ready-made. But, you know, I think since the advent of the internet, I've done entire movies where a costume designer never did one single sketch. And when you're looking at a sketch, it's because they have somehow garnered some awards and I'm thinking specifically of the artist. So they've garnered some awards and then that is what uh, creates a um, impetus to do a sketch. But many designers work from period clothing to uh, implement a design and then change a lot of different things about that so that they are coming from something that is authentic, which would be the pictures that I represented. So any other ideas? Because I'm gonna talk a little bit, we have an hour, I wanna talk about the, the whole idea of the crew handbook, which we were, we were introduced to. And I'd like to uh, go through a couple of, of the assignments that we have in there and talk about some kind of alternative jobs and materials. So I'm gonna put that on the board. We've discussed the color collage. We're going to do the dressing list. And this is something that we're working on right now for Antigone, the budget based on the dressing list and a procurement plan. So um, that's something that we wanna take a look at. Alt jobs and what those might look like. Okay, one of the things that we do, and I showed you, I'll provide this is the cross plot and let's, uh, let me see if I can give that to you so that you can see the cross plot for Antigone. And we've, we have uh, for Antigone set up a Google Drive. And I was just talking to one of my colleagues and um, it's a little complicated because right now everyone has a different way that they'd like to work. So we have, I'm just gonna try and, oh, get rid of the screen. Okay. Everyone has a different way that they'd like to work. So here they wanna work on Google Drive. I have another group that works on Outlook. And then I have another group that works with Dropbox. So Car, I totally feel your pain about how can you get things to work digitally because everyone's working digitally and they're working in a wide variety of digital media. So each one of these ideas of Google Outlook or Dropbox are a way to collect certain files together. And it would be great if everyone worked the same way, but they don't. So let me just go to um, our Antigone. Oh, wait, I don't think I turned the screen back on, did I? Hey, Pam. Just a, a thought on that, um, that, you know, you have to use these different platforms for yes. receiving and delivering information. And I mean, I think, I think that's always going to be the case. I mean, I worked at companies where, you know, there were, we used Dropbox when we had to send some things to China. And then, you know, we found that Dropbox didn't work for Turkey. So we were using a different, um, a different application. And so, you know, one thing I really learned from all that is just uh, flexibility um, and um, the willingness to learn different systems. Right, so. these delivery systems that we're, that we're discussing are ways that you get your information across. So in this course, you deliver your information on Canvas and at, uh, I, I, for one, was very resistant because when I came here, it was so far away and so removed from what we actually did in the field. Um, but then we had a system called Moodle. So I had just learned Moodle. And then I read that all of the community colleges were going to embrace Canvas. 
So at City College, we have Canvas. And on Canvas, you can upload things from your Google. And you can upload Word. And you can upload PDF documents. So that is a really great way to get a wide variety of information uploaded. In. <clears throat> and these other delivery systems that we're talking about, Google Drive, you can share folders with people. It's not practical to do campus-wide because each individual instructor needs to have their own Canvas pages for your individual classes. So I'm going to show you some of the Google information in the Google Drive for Antigone. So let's go to my desktop and we'll share. This is what we're doing today, of course, but I'm going to go to the Google Drive, which is attached to your Canvas. Of course, actually I have. I'm going to show you it's attached to your email because we are a Gmail system and here's your drive. So you can on that from that, this little nine dot thing, you can get, let me just go back for a second to this. This nine dot thing is where you can go to slides. You can make very simple and quick uploading of things. If you have them in photographs or if you're grabbing them from the internet, you can kind of overlayer them and it can be a very fast way of documenting certain things. And sheets is a way to show you um, how to do a spreadsheet, which many people use in Excel for. So this is what we have opened in the last week. You can see that I have, this is a sample of the uh, video that we have done. So let's see if I can open this. And you'll get to see this is a video that we did. Oh, just a second. There we go. So that's the way we're going to look at it. this Antigone is we're going to create this sort of gra moving graphic novel via Zoom. This is our Antigone. She's filming her, she is technically filming herself. And that is um, a pretty interesting, I think it's a pretty interesting sample and a way to look at the different screens. So here is another uh, thing that we use that's in the same drive, which is our contact sheet, so that this is then a spreadsheet so that we can see each one of the performers by name, their role. Now, again, this would be easier if they were separated into men and women and chorus and whatever, but we at least can find their um, phone numbers and their emails. So again, this whole way of organizing things is extremely important. But let's go to, I'm going to do shared with me. I'm going to search my drive, which is called O2 Antigone, because it's the second. This is a pretty standard way to uh, denote this is our second show this year. So that's our folder. Here's our entire folder where we have things held. So we've got some video, we have sound, we have research images, we have Photoshop layouts, we have Antigone images, which are some research images that I put. We have costume fittings and a contact sheet. And I thought that my cross plot was in here. So I'll, I'll look for that in a second. But here are the costume fittings that we've had so that I can immediately upload these and talk to the director who is in Arroyo Grande or something and say, here's what we have looked at for Creon, okay? We looked at, uh, I think I can just zoom through these this way. So here's Creon from a distance. We may see him full length. Um, we may see him up close. And remember, if we're doing a Zoom platform, he might be here, he might be further away so that we'd see longer. Here's some variations for him.
and then we go to uh, Tiresias. So that the director has some ideas of do these fittings fit his imagery and then looking at, for example, you know, what are we going to see? Let me go back to this character. What are we going to see in a zoom shot from here up? How are we going to make this interesting? Okay. So again, these are fitting photos. So they're, they're not completely finished, but they're giving some options for the director to take a look at. This is Watchman, the guard who looks over the um, burial ground or the non-burial ground of Polynesis. And that's why Antigone's having this thing. Remember, he that's sorry, that's a blurry image, but he can come, he's gonna come running in. He'll be having his mask and his sunglasses on, and then he's gonna meet Creon. So those are some ways, very simple and easy things to do to, let me see, there we go. That, so I can communicate quickly with the director on some of these things, even though he's 90 miles away and just say, okay, how about this? Where are, are we going in the right direction here? And then these are some line options for each scene that the director's provided. Let's see if I can open this. So in other words, the director has given us what he thinks is a specific moment in a scene. So between Antigone and Ismene, no burial of any kind, no wailing, no public tears, given to the vultures, unwept, unburied, to be a sweet treasure for their sharp eyes and beaks. How horrible it'll be to decide outside the law. Now we asked the director for these so that we could have the idea of what is going on in his mind, okay? Okay, uh, let's go back. So those are some, again, talking about communication. We had a series of images that I shared with him. We talked about each specific character, then I could do costume fitting so that then he can see, here are the costumes that we have that are available that would work in this situation. And not that they're absolutely complete, but that they are close enough to complete that he can visualize the actor wearing them in the format in which we're gonna present the piece. Does that make sense to everybody? And do you have any questions? So then we do something called a dressing list, which is just a basic um, list of what the actor is wearing. And I'll show you how that starts. And it's really super simple. Let me get to my Antigone desktop. And this is not, this may not be something that I share with the director, but it is a piece that just indicates, okay, this is what it's going to look like. So we take one of those, um, you know, costume ideas. When we go into a fitting, we should have something like this prepared. So that we detail out when we saw Creon, for example, we can detail out that he's wearing a white crew neck undershirt, a shirt, long sleeve, collar attached, LSCA is a symbol for long sleeve collar attached, it's tan. He's wearing trousers that are olive drab fatigue. His jacket is olive drab fatigue. The jacket has a self belt, which is olive drab fatigue. He is wearing a belt, which is leather to hold his pants up. He's wearing black socks. He has actually green sketcher boots on because he's a little bit elevated, he's not exactly military. He's wearing a black beret. Part of that was to give him a bit of age because the Eurydice is going to be much older than he is. A multi-stripe waist sash and a black tie. So <coughs> taking this format then, you can see that we are using it for the studio to check this out because the actors are going to come and pick this up. So this is a dressing list and I want to show you the numerous ways that a dressing list can be extremely valuable. So 
this is, we're going to use this as a studio checkout list. As I put these into a garment bag for the actor to pick up because they'll get dressed at home and film themselves at home or where they, wherever the director has indicated, they were going to put a check mark. So yes, his crew neck is in there, his tan shirt, his trousers, his jacket, his self belt, his belt to hold his pants, his socks, shoes, hat, waist sash and tie. So there's nothing that's going to be left to chance. That's all in his ditty, in his garment bag. This is on the outside of his garment bag. So then when the actor returns it, he says, yes, I have all of these things in my bag. And if he gets down here and he realizes that not everything has an X, he can say, oh, I wonder how did that belt get detached from the jacket? Let me see, maybe I just missed putting an, oh yes, it's attached to the jacket. I will just indicate it. And where are those trousers? I must have taken them off somewhere else, which is certainly very likely. He goes and finds them, he puts them in the bag, checks it off. This is gonna be on the outside of the bag. And then return on the date specified by costumes, we will then again check them in. So this is extremely elaborate, but it does show how we can keep track of things, allow them to go to an actor and allow them to come back. So, I mean, you know, at some point we have to rely on the actor to show up and say that they will take care of these things. And generally when an actor is selected for a role that is taken under consideration. So how would we use this list for a budget? Again, very simply, let's just take, get rid of this stuff. And we can do something else, right? So we can put budget. Do we have this in costume stock? So is it in our costume storage? Do we have to buy it? Can we rent it? And do we have to do significant alterations? And that is time and money, okay? So let's just go down our list. And this is what I want you to do. You're gonna do it with your, you can do it with that sketch that I've given you in your, um, in your supplies bag. So I'm gonna look at this, this undershirt. Do we have that in stock? Well, you might think yes, but if we end up with a bunch of guys that are size small and maybe we need to provide two each, we may not have 12 small undershirts. So that's something we're gonna to have to research. But I'm gonna say in this case, yes, we have it. Tan long sleeve collar attach, his size, we may need to buy it. Do we have the fatigue? Well, I think we're gonna to have to rent the uniform. Uh, the belt we have, black socks, yes. This boots, I think we have some kind of something that'll work. Do we have a beret? Yes. And do we have a sash? We might have to make this. And this is called made to order. So that's going to go over here. And again, how much time do we need? And how much is that going to cost? And this is one of the biggest things for people who have not worked professionally to understand that everything that costs time is money. So I'm gonna go down my list and I do have a tie. So I'm not worried about that. So I'm looking at the things I need to buy. All right, the things I have in stock, those are all gonna work. Um, I may have the materials in stock here, but I will need to make that Oh, let's actually do it this way. All right. And here I'm going to have my final dollar amount. Okay. So I don't have to buy a crew neck t-shirt, so that's going to be zero. I do need to buy a shirt. How much does a man's shirt run? Do I, can I in this day of COVID, can I go to thrift stores and try and find one out? Do I want to expose myself to do that? Or do I want to simply um, order one online and maybe I have a great catalog 
uh, Macy's thing and I can get one for 19.95. Okay. I'm going to rent and actually I will make myself a note to post a rental sheet so that you can see how much because this is going to go into your crew handbook. How much does it cost to rent a uniform? Well, if I'm buying, if I'm renting a complete uniform together, and and when you see the sheet, you'll be horrified. But pants are usually around sixty, jackets are usually around a hundred. Uh, the belt then would go with that, but it would be priced separately. So for rentals, I'm going to have that amount invested. This leather belt, which we have in stock, will be zero. Black socks, fortunately, we have zero. Some. When I first got here, the first three shows, all I did was buy men's shoes and men's shirts. And everything else had to come from stock. So uh, now the black beret, yes, I have found one. So that's zero. And this sash, hmm, okay, do I have fabrics on hand? Do I need to, to buy fabrics? How am I going to do that? So that's going to take that's going to take two hours to find fabrics and it's going to take two hours to make it. It also has fringe, you know, it has a wide variety of things. So I'm going to look at maybe I have fabrics here and I'm going to look for those fabrics. So those are also going to be maybe free, but I will need two hours to buy it. If you are going to put a garment into a workshop, you're gonna pay $45 an hour. So that's gonna be $90 an hour. This is the biggest thing that people do not recognize when they're working and they go from academia to professional work is that everything costs money. These things that I'm renting, are they going to be exactly the right size? Well, you know what? I'm gonna to have to take those sleeves up. That's $25. Gonna to have to hem those pants. That's another 25. Okay, so I'm going to add that to this piece, which then becomes, so my rental is here 60. My jacket is 100. And this, the belt, even though it matches, is another 20. So now I'm at 85 over here. I'm at 125. And I'm at 20. So then I can look at my final total for the one costume that we have for Creon. Let's just see if I can find my toolbar for that. Is $339.95 for one costume. Now, this gives me a budget and it gives me a procurement plan. This line is procurement. Where am I gonna get it? Where does it come from? Where do I need to return it to? Uh, you know, sometimes on a show, we'll have things from five different rental houses that we need to track, or we might be able to borrow it from UCSB. In this day, this COVID time, we can't borrow clothes from anything. So here's my procurement plan. I know that this is my dressing list. You can do this before the fitting. You know that you're gonna have a generic and I'll show you a generic in a second. So that you can say, okay, is that gonna come from stock? Do I need to buy it? Do I need to rent it? How much time is it gonna cost me to do this? Right now we have no shop staff, so I have to job things out. So I'm jobbing things out. Oh, there's one other thing that's not on here that we're making a specialty item which is Creon's order. He has a he has a patch or a or a patch of order. So that's been designed by our scene designer. Those are getting handmade. And I'll Andrew is making them and I'll see how much it's costing. But he, we're making 16 of them and I'm hoping that by the time he has, of course, you have to do a sample. You have to do research and development and you have to see how much is that going to cost me. So let's say each of those then cost $20 a piece. So that's another 20 on to Creon and that puts us right up at 360. 
So this is our budget. based on how our procurement plan works, based on the work that we need to do and what everything is gonna cost. So you see all these zeros, yay. And then even the modest things that we're purchasing or that we're renting for a very, very modest amount. This is your biggest help in trying to get someone to, let me just do this as a save as, budget procurement so that you guys can see that when we refer to it later. This is your biggest help when you are talking to a producer and my producer is a school. You know, well, why is it gonna cost you so much? You know, why don't you just have that? I don't have permission to save files in that location. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, now, I wanna show you a are you guys just seeing the Antigone dressing list only? Yes. Yeah, that's all I can see. Okay, great. I'm gonna stop share. And then I'm gonna to go to what I call a generic dressing list. And this is how we start the show. So I can use something like uh, this and you will see, just a second, let me go there and I'll open it up and you'll see how generic it is. And it is very helpful so that before I go into fittings, I can actually see what it is I need. I just said I have so much stuff on my desktop. I'm trying to find the right folder. Um, and then usually it's right in plain sight and I somehow just can't see it. Hmm. Oh, here we go just at the bottom. So again, let's look at this one. This is a very generic dressing list that you might see. And it also includes some additional information. And So this would be from looking back, looking forward. You can see that there's no name, but we know everyone's gonna need an undershirt. Everyone's gonna need a shirt. Everyone's gonna need black trousers, a sport coat, a belt or suspenders, black shoes, black socks, and a pocket square. So I can do a budget putting my line items across the top saying, where are we gonna get these? How much is it gonna cost? What about alterations for pants and put in some generic numbers so that I'm looking at, is this coming from stock? Is this purchased? Is it rental? Are we borrowing it from something? Is it going to be made to order? What are the alteration costs? What's my final budget? So then I have my procurement plan and my budget. So you can see how something just as generic as this can show us and can reveal what we have. Does that make sense to everybody in terms of this discussion of how the dressing list informs the budget and informs the procurement plan? So in your folder, in your, in your baggie, I'm gonna pull out our guide. So you could do this for Antigone, but I gave you a drawing because this is how you want to work as a as a customer. If you're working from a sketch and you're reading your sketch and you're trying to figure out what are the elements that this guy is wearing. Okay, and you may have to look up what some of these things are called, but you can start by calling it a generic form, just like I had in my generic list. So this idea of dressing lists, let's talk about even what I have on today. And this is the, the first way to always look at a dressing list if you've never done it. I have my mask. First of all, how many things do you think I have on? How many things do you think I have on? Just guess, just shout out some numbers. How many items? Uh, 10. 10. I was gonna say 10 also. 10. Nine. What'd you say, Kara? Nine. Nine. 
Any other numbers? So one, of the, one of the things that you generally underestimate is how much gear do you put on every day? You know, if we're just wearing our bikini, we have two pieces, but we might have on flip flops. We might have on jewelry. We might have on other things. So, okay. Generally, there's a, two ways to think about a dressing list. You can go from the inside out. Those things that never change are the zero look. So underwear, never change in the underwear. Um, or you can go from head to toe. You can pick whichever way is easier. We tend to now go from what is not changed, starting with the zero look. That's why really at the top, it should say underwear and socks because that's gonna be the look. And then everything else is layered on top. So then we have change one, change two, change three. So that when we are in something like high society, when Tracy has nine different costume changes, we can track those very easily. And I will give you some samples of that. Where's my thing? Okay. What was the other thing I was going to write down, you guys? Oh, I the rental. I'm going to give you a rental sheet. And I'm going to give you the change list so that you can see how that works when we're working with a bigger show. Right now, we're working with a show that has one costume change. So I have earrings, mask, t-shirt, jacket, undergarments. If you want to have a certain shape, you need to allow for the undergarments. I always, for women, allow for the bra or some kind of foundation garment. I simply put in foundation so that I can determine what I want that silhouette to look like. Okay, so let's write that down. I'm going to go over here. So Pam has on earrings, mask, t-shirt, long sleeve, bra, jacket, and I'll back up so you can see me. Oh, you can't see me. Here, I'll just do this. I have on pants. I have on my lanyard. which can be a really important thing. When we did um, Curious Incident, it's one of the ways we could tell the teacher that she wore a lanyard. I have on pants. I have on shoes. I have no socks, but that would be something that would be. Uh, generally, there'd be an item. I have on a watch. Um, I have on underwear, but unless you're going to provide underwear, as in boxers or panties for women, but you may have on, besides socks, you could also have hose for women and maybe you want to do a girdle for control, control top hose, control top girdle. So this is Pam's list. Let's count it up. Let me just make sure this is everything. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten wins. Okay. So we do that so that you can see the amount of detail that you have to be thinking about when you're talking about one costume for one character. And then if you have five costumes and 17 characters, you're suddenly talking about a massive number of items to keep track of. That's why this idea of a spreadsheet and change list is so critical. And that's why it's, even though it's one costume the Antigone people are taking out, they have a very clear way to keep track of it because people aren't used to that. They're not used to tracking each one of their little earrings, their emblem, their whatever, their mask, all those things that are gonna come with that. So you're going to take this character and this was from a play I actually did uh, this was called The Curious Case of the Watson Intelligence. So this is from a play I actually did where this character actually had to morph into three or four different time periods based on this one costume. So this was a very great convertible look. But try and write down your costume item list for this character in a spreadsheet, and then you can do your procurement plan. Where are you going to get these things? 
And you can say you can get some things from our costume stock. Are you going to have to rent them? And what are you going to have to purchase? What are you going to have to alter? So questions about that part of the crew handbook. Kind of fun, huh? I mean, maybe you don't think it's fun. I think that stuff is really fun. It's very interesting. So it's a way to um, create organization out of things that really don't have, uh, um, that may not be seemingly organized. So if you've looked in your closet or your drawers or you have a hard time getting dressed in the morning, you know, there may be some benefits to looking at things this way. Anybody have any questions? Do you, do you guys have a budget at City College or do you tend to just try and pull from your stock? I determine a budget. We generally determine a budget in the spring of the preceding year. Oh, interesting. So we determine a show. Uh, generally, we have a keyed, a show that we key off of, which would be the summer musical. And then we have four other shows that we do during the year, not including the student one act. So that's actually six shows total. And it goes um, the musical. So this is what I, how I work. It's the musical and that's gonna be in the Garvin stage. Then we have a fall one which is a Garvin show, Fall 2, which is a student show. And that's the Antigone show this year. And that's in the Jerkowitz usually, which is the smaller stage. And in this, um, in this particular environment, that's going to be self-filmed on Zoom. Whereas this fall show that we did, looking back, looking forward, was in the Garvin, OK? Then we would do a spring one which is garvin and a two which is jerkowitz and the funny thing about that is the jerkowitz is our studio theater and they say oh well you know it's just a smaller show for costume it's much more close up and you really can see everything when you're only you know five feet away or sometimes less than that away and Miranda, you would say that too when you were in did um, Sense and Sensibility, which was our fall show last year in the Jerkowitz for the students. Uh huh. It's very close. Uh huh. And uh, so that is our five show season. We take a look at each one of these. Uh, we read them, determine how many actors, and then I do a budget based on that. And I have a little bit of a formula that I work with to try and get a budget for that. And our budget is reliant on what our expected ticket sales are. So our materials budget is paid for by our ticket sales. So we run like a professional theater in terms of materials that we use. And so uh, you guys decide the whole year before the year happens? We do. Uh. It's a way to target how many ticket sales we need. We have almost 1,000 season subscribers, so there's a guess about how many are going to how purchase season tickets. That allows for four shows, and then that provides us with some kind of money that we can figure out. So right now, you know, we can't, we couldn't, we didn't have a summer show, although we were going to do anything goes. We were going to do a different fall show, but we've done this one, <laughs> where we can possibly. Um, you know, make some money back on our materials that we spent. And then we are doing our Antigone show. So the budget is a point of discussion. When I work as an outside designer, when I go to PCPA, they'll say your design fee is, you know, $6,000 or whatever, and your budget is $10,000. And then you'll think about, okay, what is the show? what am I doing for this amount of money? And then you read the script and you break it down. It's like, oh, well, everybody has 23 costume changes, even though it's only three characters. Hmm, <laughs> I've done shows like that. So, you know, it's not, it's not just character driven. If you have three characters and each of them has 23 costume changes and they're gonna be in front of the audience doing those costume changes, that was this guy. 
And so, you know, these things all have to come on and off seamlessly. You know, how are you going to figure that all out? That's the brain drain part. And then you can work with your budget and your procurement plan. Does that help? Yes. So I do have, you know, I have this formula and just, and I just kind of do a multiplication. I have a number in my head and I think I read it and I guess, and then I do my formula and I see if my guess and my formula are close together. And then I usually talk to, when Clarice was here, I talked to her and I say, what do you think? And then we also have to take into consideration besides this, you know, this is a standard thing, but you even saw on Antigone, what about headwear? Right? What about wigs? And are there any special jewelry? So that emblem that we're making adds some cost, but it's the thing that we've decided is very important for the chorus because we want them to, they're gonna be on Creon's team. So we're trying to create a uniformity uh, really for 17 people. And again, this is another interesting thing. You read a play like Antigone you have six or seven major characters and suddenly now you have another 10 chorus. So your budget was based on a certain number and then that number might shift. And then you have to say, well, if we're gonna do this, then the budget number has to shift. Does that make sense to everybody? But if you don't have this kind of paperwork to show why your budget should shift, they can't understand it. So I find it fascinating. I have a number of people who've worked in scenic and they just, they're just like, I don't know how you can keep track of the number of variables that you have to deal with. It's just, it's, it's too many, it's too much stuff. But when I was pulling those staples out and I thought, well, people who don't understand detail would never understand this job. <laughs> okay. Questions? We have some time, you could do some lab time, you can work. I was gonna talk about some alternate jobs. You know, with your crew handbook, we talked about the jobs that are in the costume shop, the supervisor, the cutter, draper, fitter, stitcher, note taker, um, crafts people, different crafts people do different things, painting, dyeing, um, which is also fabric modification. Every single movie has usually an age or dyer so that clothes don't come off the rack into the movie. Um, but what are some jobs that relate to this that maybe you don't think of in terms of costume? So people tend to get stuck with theater and movies, TV. That's the most obvious, right? And then there's theme park. Most of them have a costume, definitely a costume element. There is um, commercials, cruise ships. Yeah, commercials are up here, yeah, commercials. And a lot of times commercials are a way you get in. Um, there's there's so much um, artist video now that often people get in because of a music act and they've worked with a particular artist on some kind of video. And I'm just using this loosely for whatever kind of media that the artist is putting out. But all of them are asking someone to take a look at what they are wearing and style them. Anytime you use that term style, you're designing. You are making a choice about the specific end product that is going to appear in the finished form, whether that's print, and print is another place where they use a lot of um, costume print ads. But again, print is really tricky because once you want it, once it is a photograph, you can look at every single detail so that print the detail is has to be perfect. So these are pretty straightforward. You know, we think of those as all typical 
um, places where you do costume. But what about all the people that wear uniforms? Oh, like hotels and stuff? Like hotels. We just had a big hotel open and they had to, they had all brand new figuring out what kind of uniforms they were going to wear. What about sports teams? Another big uniform thing. What about uh, law enforcement? And I, you can bet that some of those are going to be changing now when we have this, this sort of re configuration of what the police are. I think that, you know, police used to be a wide variety of colors. If you look back to the 50s, and then everybody started going narrow and narrow, narrow, midnight blue, black, midnight blue, black. What was that about? Intimidation. Okay. So when you think about what they're doing, it's what is the purpose of the costume they're wearing? Their uniform is a costume, right? Their uniform's a costume. All the airlines, Postal. Even schools, yeah. like janitors and stuff. Yeah, schools. You know, there's just a huge, a huge field of this even before we get to fashion. And fashion is a way, and as we talked about early in the semester, these are taking an end product for a very specific purpose. Fashion is going to the mass market to create a look and hopefully to be lucrative and make money off of something, make money off of a particular image. And fashion draws on all of these things. This thing about artists, I mean, there's so many, so much room in artists. And just like you said, Cara, you do you know, poker. Everybody that's sitting around the poker table, they're gonna have certainly a certain kind of hair. Let's get their hair together. If you're being filmed in any way, and now everyone can be filmed, and it wouldn't surprise me if there ended up being, you know, art, uh, artists or costume designers or work on TikTok and other kinds of formats. And when we have all the social media outlets that then become important, politicians, there are people that are really um, that are really advising the politicians every step of the way. Is this a look that is splits the difference between authoritative and user friendly? Right? They're trying to get where can we split the difference, and particularly with women in politics, it is a very tricky way. Notice that, you know, I've never seen Biden's wife in pants, except if she is, was doing that personal video. Same with um, Melania, never seen either one of those in pants, yet uh, Kamala Harris, always in a pantsuit. Interesting. But someone is advising them on their costumes. I actually had a friend who worked with the Clintons when they were doing their, when he was running for president. So that's, a, that's another whole realm. But think about all the many fingers that once you get an idea of look, where you can expand that interest, wherever your interest is, you can expand that into a wide variety of jobs. And there are a lot of jobs. And I don't think I said this to this class, but the very first job I got in a movie I got because I had a sewing machine and I knew how to sew. It was a, it was a low budget, no non-union movie, and they needed somebody to come on as a seamstress to do some, you know, on-set alterations. That was, that worked into being on-set, that was in the prep, that worked into being on-set during the shoot. I could be, I was the on-set customer and I was responsible for making sure that the continuity was appropriate. And then we had a costume supervisor and we had a designer. So, you know, there's a, there's a wide variety of ways that you can get into all the different kinds of media. And as I say, when you're looking for a job in the future, get as close to the job as you can. Work in a field, work in a position that gets you as close to the job as you can that is related 
So other jobs that I had, I worked in a fabric store. By the time you're done with this class, you'll know more than most of the people that work in a fabric store. And when you go to a fabric store, it will, how many of you have been intimidated by a fabric store? You will no longer be intimidated. You'll be able to go into a fabric store. You know the straight of the grain. You know if they're cutting it on grain and you'll know what the fiber is because our next group that we're gonna talk about is fabric ID and that's gonna be all your cool little samples. So anybody have, we have 15 minutes. We can just cut out early. Ha ha. <laughs> And thank you for your patience and getting on this morning. I somehow could not get my internet working at the school. Not, a, you know, your internet is insecure. Try this. So anyway, I appreciate your patience with that. I just want to say, Pam, the procurement part of costuming is really a lot of fun because you go a lot of different places. It's sort of like a treasure hunt. And when you find the right piece, like if you have something that's really challenging and you figure out where to find it or how to make it it's it's really rewarding well that's a very good point catherine because again that's not something that we talk about here but let's just talk about where's that string let's just talk about if we were going to do a procurement plan just for the jacket that i have on and that's a really that's a good point because this is where you start walking around to find things so we're trying to match the sketch or let's say i need to make three of these jackets I have one. So what am I looking for? And when Catherine says go all around, when you're talking about LA, you're going all around. Well, the major thing is I'm looking for the outerwear fabric. Right? Did you catch the lining? So I'm looking for a very specialty lining. I'm looking for this finished trim right here. Did you make that jacket, Pam? No, I'll tell you. You want to know where this came from? Sure. Target Here's store. Oh, Target. Nice. Yeah. That's a pretty good looking jacket for Target, I have to say. You only know, have to know what to look for. So this yeah. is a grommet, right? So now I'm doing findings. And that's when you're looking for buttons and zippers and all that kind of stuff. And this is a toggle. So now I'm looking for grommets and toggles and I'm going around and looking and trust me, this is not far fetched. You will put something on an actor and you know, the actor falls in love with it, the director falls in love with it and then you realize you need four of them. And now you're on this, the procurement plan for the particular item. So there are some other things that we need to take into consideration with this item. So the sleeves have different lining, right? So that's completely fine. Is there any interfacing in here? So we need to have the shaped pieces. And then what other things do we need to be concerned with? Thread color, right? So then you're talking about procurement plans for thread. This is lining and then we have sleeve lining separately. And you're looking at quantities for that. And then we have shapers, shaped pieces. Do we need shoulder pads? Do we need interfacing? So for every garment, you have a wide variety of things that you need. And then you need to do how many, what are the numbers that you need for each? And then do you have enough for spares and oh yeah, then they just happen to put this grommet right here and, but no toggle on the pocket, okay? And then this, I've always wondered about this, but look at this crazy band that they just stitched in down at the bottom. Intentional, it's not in the lining and it also is reflected in the sleeve. So it's just a, it's just a stitched and cut detail to create some kind of interest. So just for one garment that we quickly easily put down as Jacket, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We need to shop nine different kinds of things. Probably in, in could be in several different places. Like these might, the findings might be in a different place than these particular outer linings, outer garments and lining fabrics. So 
yeah, that procurement stuff, super fun. And Catherine is talking from experience because she shopped um, for the Iris Cirque show that came to Los Angeles. And that was, how many months was that, Catherine? I was on that job for about three months. It was a lot of fun. And that was simply to find the supplies for them to make the things that they need once they got to Los Angeles. Yep. And that included fabrics, you know, it was everything, everything. So it was a lot of fun. And so when you're working on a play, you don't have 90 days to begin to find the things. You have to really work quickly. And also with movies, you're getting less and less prep time. They, they well, it's, it's interesting to me on a Vegas standpoint that a lot of productions, and they'll come from LA or New York, right. but they suddenly get cheap in the costuming. And they want you, they don't have, you know, like I see productions that come into town. And like you said, everything's accounted for. They have back stock of everything. They purchase what they don't have. It all goes input it into inventory. Like it's this huge, right. amazing thing. And then you get the other productions who are just being cheap. And these can be like national commercials, but for whatever reason, by the time they got to Vegas, they lost brain cells and they don't want to budget for it. <laughs> and so, you know, we're running around trying to find t-shirts that are cheap and you know 10 pairs of the same kinds of jeans and you know you're lucky you can find three in stock you know so it's interesting the levels and the different when you're in a really good production and when you're in a I, fly by night I completely agree and then sometimes it's just the luck of the draw I was doing a series of commercials for um, John Deere it's a big agricultural equipment manufacturer they're based in Horicon, Wisconsin. They make tractors, they make um, lawnmowers, they make riding lawnmowers, they make um, these big machines that go through and dig up the soil. So uh, we're meeting with the director, we have a storyboard, here's everything we're gonna do. We're making a parade for John Deere. Okay, that's a lot of people. <laughs> First of all, it's a whole parade and then there's a lot of people on the sidelines. Well, you know, we're gonna just usually most, we're just gonna use like regular people and then we'll have a few people. It's like, okay, yeah, we're gonna use these five guys, these kind of like oldsters, we're gonna kind of key on them. We left LA. I did a bunch of stuff and I put it in a truck and sent it and then I flew. We were there for two weeks. And then we get, then we get to the day before we're gonna film and I knew they were going to use the lawnmower drill team. And I said, are you sure you don't want the lawnmower drill team to look uniform in some way? No, 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 we definitely don't. They are each individual. They're all bringing their own unit. Of course, all their units matched, but we don't need them the day before. Oh, you know what? We'd like them to all match. Can they all wear something matching? All right. 50 men. <laughs> And I'm not gonna see them till the day they come, next, the next day, the next morning. So now I have to make 50 men match. And I'm thinking, I'm in Horicon, Wisconsin. There's right. nothing here. And so I, and I was kind of like an hour away from Madison and I thought, okay. I said, we can do white polo shirts and khaki pants. They'll wear, and I'm just saying this in the meeting, it's like, what are you gonna do, Pam? I'm gonna do white polo shirts and khaki pants. So everybody could wear their own khaki pants. Like I figured you better have khaki pants and then I can scrounge around and find 20 pairs. And if we don't use them, I can return them. And white polo shirts, again, I have no idea what size. So that's when the breakdown and the understanding just human nature, like what are we gonna have? And you do a, you do a, a thing like this, X, S, small, medium, L, X, L, double X and knowing the Midwest, you know, and knowing the director I worked with, he loved to have extremes. So we have XXL. We also had to, no, XXL, XXL, triple X. So I have 50. So I'm thinking maybe most of the men are gonna be in this range. So let's say we're gonna do 10 and 10. Mm eight, five, two, three of these, five of these. 
Okay, and then I count it up. Okay, that's 16, 26, 36, 41. Let's put these at 15 each. 15L, 15XL, so now I have 38 plus eight, that's, that's 46, and that gives me, that's not a lot of spares, right? So I'm gonna put this into eight. So I do a, I do a, you know, you have to do a guess. You do a mathematical guess and you say it's gonna cost you, well, how much can I get a polo shirt for? Okay, so I need 50 and I'm gonna say I can get them for 15 bucks. So I'm gonna, this is gonna cost you $750. And then I'm doing the math and I'm gonna say, we need a thousand. Just because you guys didn't think about it before we left LA, but I need a thousand dollars so I can go buy 50 polo shirts that more or less match. And then what we did is we individualized them. We bought a couple pairs of pants and they wore white polo shirts and khaki pants. They all brought a belt. They all wore their boots. Some of them had John Deere baseball caps on and they could, they could provide 50 of those because that was the John Deere merchandise. So yeah, that's exactly right, Cara. Sometimes people come and they're like, well, what can you do for us? Because we didn't think about it in advance. But we did think about the fact that we were going to have two Little League baseball teams. So I brought Little League baseball uniforms from LA. I brought clown suits to create clowns for this parade from Los Angeles. I made one girl into a little princess with a, with a you know, a crown and a baton and a velvet cape and you know different kinds of things little miss so-and-so um, what is going to be your how are you going to tell the story the narrative of the parade so it's just you know all that kind of stuff very important and you see it all and you just have to embrace it all it's like what we said the delivery management system or the delivery management system <laughs> whatever it is okay good good um good discussion. Anything else for today? Uh, we remember we're going to have our labs. I will post some more labs up. Smenson, I'll see you at four. And I have two to four. Catherine, I'll see you at 315. And then we'll, we'll get some other labs happening so that don't worry about getting your notebook if it's not completely finished because you don't understand something. Let's work on that so that we get everybody up to speed. We're really halfway through. We've done the midterm. And you have a lot of opportunity to make extra credit points. Okay. Mm -hmm. By the way, one extra credit play and I'll start posting some online musicals and plays that you can look at and you can do an extra credit play report, 50 points. So that is a great thing. I'll start posting some of those. And there's some wonderful plays to watch that just are really exciting. So my internet dropped out, but did, were you able on that shoot to find 50 white polo shirts? Yes. You did? Yeah. Wow. Because Sears was still in business. So I did Sears, Target, Walmart, and it's, um, and I just, I had my size sheets and I got them. And then wow. in the next day, and I looked at the guy and I'm thinking, okay, you're this. And I always going back to my grid, remember my measurement grid? I always have the biggest guys come in first because if I can fit them, I can always go down sizes to fit others. But if I put somebody in this double X and I don't have a double X for somebody, I'm then I need something, right? And then you can't yeah. take a shirt off of somebody in the middle of a shoot and put it on somebody else. That's creepy. Yeah. So I just start and work my way down the list. Yeah, yeah, we did it. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, you just, I mean, you know, always say yes. And give them a realistic number. <laughs> this is how much it's going to cost you. All right. So you have your procurement. You can do your dressing list on this guy. You can do your procurement plan on him and your budget. I thought that'd be a little more interesting than doing a contemporary Antigone. But it's for your crew handbook. And I will, I'm going to actually share with you the rehearsal reports and then some performance reports and the rental sheets. Okay. So expect those, they'll be on Canvas and you can just download them and print them so that I want you to be familiar with it. We'll talk about those. Any other questions? If not, we can say goodbye. Going once.
Pam? Yeah. Um, I'll go ASAP because like um, my home is a little bit far from SVCC and then I took the bus. So yeah, I think I'll, you, I'll come, come by. Here? I'll come by like 345 maybe. Yeah, I'm done with my class at 305, you know, so you're going to come right up after yeah. class, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Okay. All righty. Pam? Okay, who is the second one? It, Pam, it's Catherine. Yes. Oh, do you have a second to do a breakout room? Hold on a second. Let me get rid of this. Let me see everybody. Bye, everyone. See you guys Bye. next day. Bye. Yeah, let me do a breakout room. If anyone else wants to stick for a breakout room, I will happily um, get you in there. So let me. Thank you, Pam. Okay, bye bye. Thanks, Pam. Bye. Bye. Oh, well, Catherine, we're the only two people here. Let me end the recording. Sorry.